You've highlighted the research is coming from America, the technology. I mean, China has got its own AI world for sure. Um, India is starting to emerge in that, on that front as well. But certainly for us, it's all coming from the states. Yeah. And what do you do about that? Because I can't see anything emerging in Europe that has kind of got the, the counter argument uh, in terms of you know the prowess and the power of, of, of where this is going. And what is the role, given that we're talking about higher ed here, what is the role there of universities to kind of drive this? Because to me it seems as, as if universities either don't have the budget, don't have the kind of uh, prowess to move, whereas in, in the States the landscape is more fluid between the commercial research and the, yeah. and the AI researcher. It's, it's rather exceptional in this part of the world, I think. Um, so how do you see that kind of evolve in terms of you know the university landscape needing to change to kind of make sure that we come up with some clever AIs uh, too? Well, well what, as always, I have a sort of belief in this because I'm old, I think, that the higher education system in, in the UK especially, because we sell a traditional model to yep. students, that's what keeps it all afloat now. You know, that yield, jolly England, Oxbridge thing. Europe's slightly different and America's very, very different. But I think, you know, when, when I look at my lifetime and see how have things reformed in higher education, there's only one person that matters to me and uh, she was a woman called Annie Lee. And anybody know who Annie Lee is? Nobody. Annie Lee is an amazing woman who was a minister in the Harold Wilson government in the 60s, wrote a white paper recommending the open university. Yeah. It was fought like tooth and nail by the higher education establishment. Nobody wanted the open university. What's the biggest university in the UK as we speak right now? 173,000 students, the open university. Anybody know what the biggest university in the US is? By student number. No? No? ASU, isn't it? No, S S N H U. Nobody's ever heard of it. South New Hampshire University. 200,000 students. An amazing place. Paul LeBlanc, read his book, Students First. He took it from 2,500 to 200,000 students. And that's because things happen from the outside. The Open University didn't happen from within higher education, it happened to it. Now, I think something similar will happen in AI. Now, go back to Ashok Gold has been talking about this for a while. I, don't, I think you'll see the emergence of some quite powerful players in the US, not Europe, that will come, which are really AI-driven universities, which take advantage of this huge scalability of this technology to both help teaching and learn. Now, the learning side is far more important than the teaching side. I totally agree with you on that. And that's because teaching is fossilized in higher education around lecturing. Yeah. And you can't shift it. I get, I, you know, I've, I've been in and out of universities all my life. They always ask me to lecture, and I go, you know, lecturing is really easy. Teaching is really hard. <laughs> That's why people love lecturing. It's so easy to walk up, rattle on with your PowerPoint for an hour and walk up. It's the easiest thing in the world. Try teaching. That's a really different game, which is why I like secondary school teachers. They know about teaching. Now, how are we going to get out of this quandary? Well, I think we already have several really good academic papers. The, the evidence is flooding onto the market now that it gives you, from the learner's perspective, all your students are using this technology. They've been using it for ages. So when I hear a university say, oh, we're going to run a course on prompting for the students, I go, who's going to deliver that course then? <laughs> what? All you experts. Probably the students, I would say. <laughs> well, exactly. <laughs> If I want help, like, I'm an AI guy, and I think I know this stuff technically and so on, but I go to my two sons for a real advice on this stuff, because they're immersed in that world. Yeah. So I think your students will be using it, are, they are using it. They're, I mean, let's talk about the learning journey, learning engagement. I hate the word engagement in learning, you know? I think it's just such a crap word. I go to the Edinburgh Festival every year, I love stand-up comedy, a good friend of mine is a stand-up comic, and I've been doing it for years massively engaged every time i love it can't remember a single joke not one and that's because it's not about that type of fun engagement at all it's a very serious business learning absolutely and I, I, i'm glad you said it because it often gets like it has to be fun yes it has to be 
fun, but bit, it has to be trigger the curiosity to learn. Yeah. And learning can be incredibly hard, and we shouldn't kind of belittle that. And I, I think that is one of the things that sometimes in edtech we go on the wrong path because we kind of start like it all has to be fun. It can't all be fun because, like you're saying, it's messy and it's difficult. Well, I think, in, in that sense, I think you should be giving seriously helping your students use AI or note taking, for example, there's a really interesting guy speaking immediately after this called Dave Tucker, he runs a company called Glean, and he's using AI to effect that bridge from the notes in a lecture, because you ain't going to stop people lecturing, let's be realistic. You know that bridge in, because most kids don't learn in a lecture room, they learn in the library in the quiet of their own room. But if you can get that bridge right, so note take, the, the reason lectures are so terrible is, you know, you sit and take notes, as you take the note, the lecturer has moved on, you miss it. So you, and so what we do is we take the transcript, compare it to the lecturer's transcript, and see if the student's got any gaps, and then help them, and then self-generate self-assessments, links to the web, all sorts of stuff. But the interesting thing here is I think the way this is going is to really help students to learn. In other words, extend your teaching. You know, you can only do your lecture, you've only got so much time, you really want to be doing research, let's be honest. You go, into the, you go into that world, but make sure you have got autonomous environments for your students to really, really learn effectively. Optimize their learning using this technology. It's not about you telling them how to use AI, because they know more. Was a, a, a deviation curve here, you know. The past all, the hundred million people who are using this, I go to universities and I say, how many people have got chat GPT for? <laughs> really? And you're, talk, and you're going to teach AI and you haven't even used four yet? Because most of them have got this sneaky, you know, actually I've only got 3.5 and all that stuff you see in Twitter. Oh, look, you can't do this. Well, that's because you're using ChatGPT 3.5 and that's like using Wikipedia from 2006. So I think, you know, we've got all